Good afternoon, dear friends. Welcome to the University of St. Francis and uh, this latest in the lecture series from the Department of Philosophy and Theology, of which I am the chair, Adam DeVille. I want to welcome you on this uh, bright, sunny afternoon. It's hard to believe, but in two weeks and just over two hours, as the sun sort of disappears down the western sky, we'll be gathering in vigil to look for the first star of Christmas. And Christmas, of course, commemorates the coming in the flesh of the Son of God. And as we're inundated with all of the uh, busyness of this season and all of the anticipation, it's good uh, to take a moment to reflect on the wisdom of God in coming in the flesh and to lead us through such a reflection on the wisdom of the Lord is a very wise sister in our department, Sister Felicity. Um, uh, whom it is my delight to be able to introduce for this talk. Some of you may remember that last year we got snowed out. Uh, so uh, I gave some of you an assignment a couple of months ago to pray for good weather, and you obviously did that, so thank you. Uh, and we have nice warm weather. Uh, and as a bonus, you get to see the uh, loveliness of this house decorated for the season. Uh, and so if you haven't yet checked out some of the other rooms, if you want to just linger for a moment on your way out to appreciate some of the wonderful decorations that have been put up and provided by people in the community uh, to beautify an already beautiful setting. Uh, I will just make one quick announcement now, and that is that this uh, concludes the fall lecture series. We have a number of lectures for the spring. Uh, two of them, I'm still trying to get them nailed down there kind of tricky to book a couple of these people. So our first lecture looks like it won't be until the middle of February, uh, and then March, and then probably two in April. But the mailings and information about that, uh, both uh, paper mail and on the website and other forms of communication will go out uh, probably early in the new year. We don't have anything booked for January yet, uh, so you get a bit of a break, uh, but uh, certainly once we get into the spring semester, we will resume our lecture series and uh, watch and stay tuned for the details of those. Sister Felicity. Much of what I'm going to talk about today is context and some explanation for the unique verse in John's Gospel, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, or in another translation, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we saw his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. We're going to start with creation. Genesis chapter 1. And if you know the prologue to John's Gospel, it too begins in the beginning. So, in the beginning, in a cosmic sense, God created the heavens and the earth. He said, let there be light. And there was light. And if you're scientific, that was the Big Bang, okay? So God created light in stars and galaxies. The astronomers take pictures and they're very beautiful. But now we're going to take a step back in history to get some historical context for understanding that passage in John's Gospel. And we're going to start with a Babylonian text called the Enuma Elish. What you say is the Enuma Elish. Well, for one thing, it's an artifact. There are clay tablets that are written in cuneiform that come from about 600 years before the time of Jesus. But probably the text goes back to some 1,700 years before Christ. It's a poetic description of the creation of the world according to Babylonian ideas. And it was political justification for the lordship of the god Marduk, who was the lord of all the gods. And there are fragments of this text that have been found in various places, both in Sumerian and in Babylonian. And here's a picture 
of a couple of those clay tablets, and no, I will not read them to you. Now, the story of the Enuma Elish is really violent, and it talks about how all their, these generations of gods and goddesses um, are noisy, and they disturb the mother goddess, and so she decides that she's going to destroy everybody. And Marduk takes up weapons against her and saves everybody. So in the end, the people, the gods rather, decide they're going to build Marduk a temple. But they're gods and they get tired. And so they decide they're gonna create human beings as slaves to make the temple to Marduk. Now, in our Bible, we don't have six generations of pagan gods and goddesses. What we have are six days. So the priestly writer who put together this account that's at the beginning of our Bible in Genesis chapter 1 took the, the idea of six, six days of creation. And I'm not going to read you the chart, but you can go through and you can see a pattern where the gods of this and the gods of that are similar to what God is creating on the six days. Now, how do we get this in our Bible? Well, there was a lot of oral tradition, for one thing, before things got written down. And the earliest sources we have among them are the J source, um, which was from the south, the southern kingdom, and the Esorch, which was from the Northern Kingdom. After the kingdom split, those sources were put together. We have the D source, which is mostly the book of Deuteronomy. And then we have P, which stands for the priestly writer. And the priestly writer or writers were the final editors of putting together the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And it was the priestly writers who decided to put this creation account right at the beginning of the Bible. It stresses the power, the majesty, the glory of God. All he did was speak, and it happened. And after it was done, he saw that it was very good. God does good work. Now, we're going to look at the wisdom tradition that's context for understanding what John does in his prologue. And I'm going to read to you, but they'll be on the screen too, um, several passages from three of the wisdom books. These are the three, well, they're excerpts, from three of the great wisdom poems that we find in what we call the Old Testament. And the first is from Proverbs 8. Now, wisdom is personified. Wisdom is speaking, and it's lady wisdom. The Lord begot me, the beginning of his works, the forerunner of the deeds of long ago. From of old I was formed of the first, before the earth, when there was no deeps, when there were no deeps, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains or springs of water, before the mountains were settled into place, before the hills, I was brought forth. When the earth and the fields were not yet made, nor the first clods of the world. And this is continued. When he established the heavens, there was I. When he marked out the vault over the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he fixed fast the springs of the deep, when he set for the, seas, it, for the sea its limit, so that the water should not transgress his command, when he fixed the foundations of earth, then was I beside him as artisan, I was his delight day by day, playing before him all the while, playing over the whole of the earth, having my delight with human beings. That's Lady Wisdom. 
The next comes from the book of Sirach. From the mouth of the Most High I came forth and covered the earth like a mist. In the heights of heaven I dwelt, and my throne was in a pillar of cloud. The vault of heaven I comp compassed alone and walked through the deep abyss. Over waves of the sea, over all the land, over every people and nation I held sway. And finally, from the book of wisdom, with you is wisdom who knows your works and was present when you made the world. So we have a very strong connection in the Hebrew scriptures between wisdom and God's creation. Personified wisdom is there with God at creation as God creates. Now, just as we had uh, an ancient Near Eastern connection with uh, the Enuma Elish, we've got other wisdom literature in the ancient Near East. And just very briefly, uh, the two big groups of this were the Egyptians and the Babylonians. They were the two big civilizations. Um, in the Egyptians, generally their wisdom was upbeat, optimistic, cheerful. Um, until Egypt was conquered, and then the wisdom took a more pessimistic turn. And the Babylonian wisdom tended to be more pessimistic just in general. And when the Bible, we have some of each. We have optimistic wisdom and we have pessimistic wisdom. But most significantly, we have lady wisdom. And in Hebrew, her name is Kokmah. In Greek, her name is Sophia. And there are some people who think that if you read the description of the perfect wife in Proverbs 31, um, that it's describing her. Um, you've probably heard that passage if you've gone to weddings, you know, she looketh well to the ways of her household and all her charges are doubly clothed, etc. cetera. Um, she's quiet. She leads people to life. And there you have Sophia. Now, in the Egyptian wisdom literature, we have a couple of goddesses. One is Ma'at. And Ma'at is the, wis the goddess for justice and truth. And if you look in her right hand, you can see that she's holding an ankh. It looks like a cross, except it has a loop at the top. The ankh is the symbol for life. And up on the top of her head, she has this feather. And the feather stands for truth. Another Egyptian goddess was Isis. And she, too, has the feather of truth. She also has wings. Usually, in the ancient Near Eastern iconography, wings stand for protection. Uh, you'll find thrones that have wings on the sides and along the back. And if you're into Egyptian archaeology and you saw the stuff in King Tut's tomb, on the golden doors going into where his mummy is, there are two winged figures protecting King Tut. Now, what the author of John has done is very clever. He's taken the idea of Sophia and made it into Logos. So he's taken wisdom and made it into word. Now I have to apologize. The, the picture of Sophia there is not Lady Wisdom, it's a saint. I couldn't find a nice picture of Lady Wisdom. Um, and the other picture is of the Logos of Jesus. Now the author of John's Gospel knew the Hebrew Scriptures. No two ways about it. And actually you can go through the prologue to John's Gospel, and you can find a parallel for everything that John says about the Word, with the exception of the Word was made flesh, in the wisdom literature in the Old Testament. So, first of all, wisdom and Word at the beginning. All right, we already looked at that passage from Proverbs 8. John says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. 
Secondly, if we look at the idea of creation, wisdom was with God beside him as artisan. And in John's prologue, it says, all things came to be through him, and without him, nothing came to be. The idea of light in wisdom. She is the reflection of eternal light, the spotless mirror of the power of God, the image of his goodness. For she is fairer than the sun and surpasses every constellation of the stars. Compared to light, she is found more radiant. John says, this light was the life of men. This life was the light of the human race. And the light shines in the darkness, and of course the darkness cannot grasp it. So the author of John has taken the attributes and some of the ideas of Sophia and changed them into the Logos, the Word. And there you have it three ways. Now, in the Eastern Church, I think they talk about this more than we talk about it here in the West. And Hagia Sophia, or Hagia Sophia, um, was this huge church in Constantinople. And originally it was ordered to be built by Constantine in the fourth century. It's in Istanbul or Constantinople. And it was completed in around 360 under his son. However, um, this Church of Holy Wisdom, as we have it now, was built by Justinian, and um, he began it a couple centuries later. And it became a mosque in the year 1453. Now it's like a museum, and people can go there and see how beautiful it is. You can see the four minarets around the, the building there. Now in our Christian iconography, we talk about Mary as the seat of wisdom. And I can remember when I was a child, that always struck me as very peculiar. Why would you want to be the seat of anything? Because you sit on it. But in this picture, you can see that Mary is the throne. She's the seat for her son, Jesus. She's like the throne of Solomon. And the Greek letters at the top, um, the one side is mater, mother. The other side is theou, of God, mother of God. And she's associated then with, with glory and with teaching. And this is a picture of an apse mosaic from Hagia Sophia. And here's another mosaic from Hagia Sophia. Again, you can see um, Mater Theou. Mater Theou. And um, she's in the same position. She's the throne for Jesus. Now, back to John 114. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we are celebrating this very soon. We actually sing, O come, O wisdom. And I thought, well, why don't we just sing this? It'll wake us all up for the rest of the talk. So I ask you to join me. O come, O come, Emmanuel.
shall come to you, O Israel. So when we talk about the word becoming flesh, we have this picture here. Um, you can see the angel. You can see the Holy Spirit. You can see Mary. It looks like she's playing the flute. There's a, a book by Carol Houselander that's called The Reed of God that talks about Mary where the, the spirit blows through her like a flute. And the lilies, which stand for her virginity. And the light. And I was so taken when I found this picture by um, He Chi, who's a Chinese Christian artist, that I'm going to show you some more of his pictures about the life of Jesus. I thought that it was a visual metaphor for the word becoming flesh. So I'll show you the pictures. You can see that he likes Picasso and that he's Chinese. And I thought, okay, looking at these pictures, it's not what we ordinarily look at when we see the life of Jesus. And maybe that it would convey to us some of how different it was for the word to become flesh. You notice the angel waking up the three kings? The wise men, Mary and Jesus going to Egypt and stopping on the way, Jesus speaking to the men at the temple, the teachers, his baptism his speaking to the woman at the well, the Good Samaritan. Jesus in the boat with the disciples. This is the picture that's on the cover of one of my textbooks. Jesus washing Peter's feet. Notice the key. Jesus arrested and carried off. The women weeping. The empty tomb. Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Risen Jesus found in Eucharist. And again, it looks like Emmaus. Jesus making breakfast for the disciples and from John's Gospel. And again, risen Jesus. Now, I want to look a little bit at incarnate wisdom in the New Testament. And so again, I have some passages to read to you. You've heard these before. They're nothing new. First is from Colossians. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him were created all things in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible whether thrones or dominations or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he himself might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile all things for him, making peace by the blood of his cross. 
through him, whether those on earth or those in heaven. From the letter to the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens, as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and without blemish before him. In love he destined us for adoration to himself through Jesus Christ, in accord with the favor of his will, for the praise of the glory of his grace that he granted us in the beloved. In all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will in accord with his favor that he set forth in him as a plan for the fullness of times to sum up or to recapitulate all things in Christ in heaven and on earth. And from the book of Revelation, yeah, he's the amen, the faithful and true witness, the source of God's revelation. And this is what he says. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Now later Christian writers took up this theme. We have this idea of the cosmic Christ. We find it in the writings of Saint Irenaeus, who was a bishop in Gaul in the third century. He says the incarnate word was primary in creation. Saint Maximus the Confessor from Constantinople from the seventh century says that the incarnation would have happened without human sin. John Duns Scotus picks up this idea. He died in 1308. He says love is the reason for the incarnation. This notion of the cosmic Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, says that Christ is the beginning. Everything was made through Christ. Christ is the Omega. He is the end. He is the purpose. Everything returns to God through Christ. And here we have a lovely mosaic where you can see Christ with the Alpha and the Omega. Now, St. Athanasius from Alexandria, who died in 373, he has a, a section here on Jesus Christ as incarnate wisdom. And pardon me, but I'm going to read it to you again. The only begotten Son, the wisdom of God, created the entire universe. Scripture says, You have made all things by your wisdom, and the earth is full of your creatures. That is why he was pleased that his own wisdom should descend to that level and impress upon each of them a certain resemblance to their model. So also is the wisdom implanted in us an image of the wisdom who is God's son. It gives us the ability to know and understand and so makes us capable of receiving the all creative wisdom through whom we can come to know the Father. And so since this image of the wisdom of God has been produced in us and in all creatures, the true and creative wisdom rightly says, the Lord created me in his works not wishing to be known any longer as in former times through the mere image and shadow of his wisdom existing in creatures, he caused the true wisdom himself to take flesh to become man. Yet this was the same wisdom of God who had in the beginning revealed himself and the Father through himself by means of his image in creatures which is why wisdom, too, is said to be created. Later, as John declares, that wisdom, who is also the word, became flesh. Now, around 900 years, 800, 900 years later, St. Bonaventure takes up some of these notions. Bonaventure was born in Italy in a little city called Bagnoregio on a hilltop and he died in 1274 and he declares that Christ is the center of everything. 
He says, creation comes through Christ and returns to the Father through Christ. Everything that is in creation is either a footprint, a vestige, or image or likeness of God. And Christ is the medium, the, the middle, the center. Everything goes through Christ. So we humans do too. We came forth from God and we return to God. Some of these ideas were also taken up by Teilhard de Chardin, who died in 1953. He wrote a beautiful work called The Hymn of the Universe. And he sees Christ, well, as the beginning of everything, but mostly as the omega point, and all evolution is aimed at Christ. It's a very Franciscan kind of notion. Finally, Daniel Horan, well, not quite finally, next to finally, Daniel Horan says, Franciscan contemplation is about learning to see how God is already right before us, reflected in all aspects of creation. We need to see the world anew. God is not hiding. God's footprints are everywhere. We are usually the ones with our heads in the sand or hands over our eyes. Now it's almost Christmas. It's really easy to get distracted by the tinsel and the presents and holly jolly Christmas and Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer and all of the rest of that. But the real reason we have Christmas is Jesus, who is the best present ever. And so if you would like to join me, we'll end with this prayer by Angela Foligno. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, truly there is nothing so great and wonderful as this, that you, my God, should become a creature so that we could become like God. You have humbled yourself and made yourself small, that we might be made mighty. Blessed are you, O oh Lord, who came to earth as one of us. Amen and references. I'll be happy to field questions if you have any. Thank you. Excuse me. Was that uh, Teilhard de Chardin? Mm -hmm. uh, was he a teacher, a writer, or a priest, or what was he? He was, he was all of those. He was a priest. He was a paleontologist. He was a writer. He dug up um, skeletons in China and I think in the Gobi Desert. Um, yeah, and he wrote a number of books. Hymn of the Universe. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I don't want to tell you because I'm going to say it's going to say it wrong, but he wrote a number of things, and he was a, he was a Jesuit. He was not a Franciscan. Anything else? Yes. I'm I'm curious what your thoughts are about the the fact that wisdom in the Old Testament was feminine. I, as a woman, I have sometimes found that remarkable, um, given the culture and that of you know, biblical, biblical times. Um, I found that lovely, that, that wisdom was given a feminine attribute, and just anything more you have about that, about like why, why feminine, and um, that transition. And it's also, I think, appropriate that that would then be transferred to Christ. Christ, for his time, was remarkably a woman, I think, you know, in, in ways that were almost radical, I think, if, if you really look at some of his interactions and that. So just any of your thoughts about any of that? Well, some people say, well, it was just the gender of the noun. However, that begs the question then, why was that gender assigned to the noun? 
Because there were in the surrounding ancient Near Eastern cultures goddesses of wisdom that may have influenced things, I don't know that we can definitively say, um, but certainly, yes, it is lovely. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much.